Did I know about these things more than a year ago? Yes. Did I do them? No. Hey there, it's McCair. It is time to take down the tomato. Okay. It is well past time to take down the tomatoes. <laughs> They've, it's been like a month since they froze and they're not gonna get any deader. So I know they look rough, but they were never diseased. They um, got a little overwatered when we had the flooding and that's really the only big impact that they took until the freeze. So I'm gonna cut them down, compost them, and then we'll get some comfrey and compost and mulch down on the garden bed because I don't rotate my tomatoes year after year. I don't move where they grow. I keep them in the same spot, which is nutritionally not terribly responsible, but the comfrey and the compost will fix it. There is a honeybee who is in love with me today. Let's get this done. Trash removal should come first, right? <laughs> Seems like a good plan. Now for starters, I'm gonna cut them off all the way at the ground. That way they're not gonna leave a stump that I can step on because I have learned that that doesn't feel good. <laughs> and so that the roots can stay in the ground and decay there and leave pathways for water and provide something for the soil life to munch on and all that good stuff. Step one, cutting them all off at the ground. That was easy enough, right? So now I'm gonna take my nice little garden knife and I'm just gonna cut all the ties that I use to tie them up throughout the summer and the spring and the fall. <laughs> no. Tomatoes freeze on the ground, they get really gushy. That was gross. And thus ends the most disappointing tomato season of my life. <laughs> the very first year I grew tomatoes, I grew, I want to say it was four plants, but it was a Cherokee purple, a green zebra, a brandy wine. It might have only been three, but that summer I got one purple Cherokee and two green zebras that ripened. And it was because I had my tomatoes packed really close together and I didn't prune them and I didn't know that they needed airflow back then. And Three plants and three tomatoes was actually better than I did this year. I had 18 plants and I got this many vine ripened slicer tomatoes this year because of the bad soil and the heat and the drought and the flood. I did get cherry tomatoes though and I do have tomatoes ripening it in a box inside so at least there's that. Oh yeah. Let me get this all carted off to the compost and put in there and then we will come back and we will get this bed reset. It's like a minute from raining and the hair could not stay down. I'm gonna cut these to like a foot or less per piece so that they turn easily on the compost. It also helps them to break down but really it's for turning purposes for me and if I can't turn it it's not gonna break down anyway so yeah like that and then they're just getting dumped straight into the compost and it is a big tangle of tomato plant right now. So that is going on. There are things that I could have done that might have helped the tomatoes deal with the extreme heat. The drought wasn't too much of a factor. They were well mulched. They had a good foundation. That bed has been established for a couple of years. So it's the soil's gotten loose. It's not just clay over there anymore. I mean, it's primarily clay, but it's got other stuff in there too now. So drought wasn't too big a factor, but the heat, there were things I could have done. Now, did I know about these things more than a year ago? Yes. Did I have plans to do these things seven months ago? Also, yes. Did I do them? No. So that's the problem. <laughs> One of the things I could have done is bought shade cloth and built a little structure to go in front of my tomatoes between the afternoon sun, which comes from that way, and the tomatoes. That would have been a fair expense, not one I'm looking to spend right now. 
in the future, I would love to have a shaded high tunnel or greenhouse to grow tomatoes in during extreme heat, extreme heat and to extend my season in both directions. But that is not in the budget right now. But what is in the budget and what I knew to do, meant to do, planned to do, didn't do, was to just grow some okra. In the first year that I was gardening here, I did that. I grew a row of okra in front of my tomatoes, afternoon sun okra tomatoes, and that shaded them. And, and that wasn't an extremely hot summer like we had this year, but it was hot and it did offer them some shade and it did block the worst of the afternoon sun. That is something that I will have in my plan for next year. Definitely, absolutely 100% it will be in my plan. Will I actually execute it? We shall see. That's all gonna be up to how I'm doing and what the spoons are like and just everything. But at least this year, I know that the bad soil is out there and I know to test my soil first. Just in case you haven't caught any of that, there is a problem going around with bagged soil, commercial soil, and with commercial compost. And I imagine it's probably in some people's personal compost as well. That is a problem with persistent herbicides. It's a problem that has been increasing over the last several years. This past year, it's gotten to the point where it's really a problem and a lot of people are dealing with it. There are ways to remediate the soil. Check with Jess over at Roots and Refuge. She's doing this whole like mushroom composting um, thing to rehabilitate her soil. She's testing out that theory. And then uh, Jill Winger, she had the Kellogg's bagged soil, which is the one that I had, tested and it is completely depleted of nitrogen. I don't know if it also has the persistent herbicides in it, but what we do know is that neither of those, <laughs> whether it's the persistent herbicide problem or just nitrogen depletion, neither of those will grow like beans and peas very well. I will be planting beans into any soil that comes into this system from now on just to make sure that it goes. If it doesn't go, then I got more figuring out to do, right? That way, at least I won't lose hundreds of plants like I did this year. And now that I'm telling you, you're not gonna lose hundreds of plants either. So y'all, here's a funny little thing. I mean, the whole story is not funny, but yeah. I meant to shoot this video on Monday. Today is Thursday. And I was getting some things ready and you may know I had a birthday on Saturday. I am 50. I made myself some red beans. I made myself some sourdough so I could have garlic bread with my red beans. And then I wanted cinnamon rolls too. So I made some sourdough cinnamon rolls and that was a couple of days later. I made them on Monday and um, I was gonna put pecans in them because that sounded really good. And so I got some pecans, which should be a single ingredient food and I candied them and they smelled so good. They were pecan pieces. So I had one little piece like this big, right? Before I read the package which said that these pecans were processed on the same equipment as soy. This is the part where it's not a funny story. So, dear me care, having already eaten a teeny little bite of this pecan, thinks, well, I can't tell you what I thought because, yeah, that language isn't really uh, safe for this channel. But that's what I thought. And, uh, you know, I was like, okay, maybe it'll get me, maybe it won't. It did. About 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes later, there's a nice boa constrictor wrapping itself around my chest. My food allergy results in anaphylaxis in my lungs. I brewed myself a big pot of black coffee because black coffee is a bronchodilator. And I drank a full, almost a full French press of coffee. And then I fell asleep. And my lips were only a little bit blue and my fingernails were only a little bit blue. So not awful, definitely not the worst that has ever happened to me. But I did get prickly in my throat and that was the first time for that. So new and exciting. Also so scary that such a small bite could do that. But um, the last couple of days I've come out to try to get this done and like I'll walk down to where the tomatoes are and I was completely winded. So today, <laughs> finally able to get out here and do this today. You have no idea how mad I am 
at myself because that was stupid mistake. I should never eat anything without reading it. Even if it should be a single ingredient food, I just, yeah. So fortunately I discovered it before the pecans went into the cinnamon rolls. I did manage to get the cinnamon rolls assembled and into the refrigerator and just baked them the next morning. So that's the um, ridiculous thing that I did to myself this week. Not proud of it. Not proud of it. I'm almost finished. Is that the head lift? That's done. We need comfrey. And then I've got a little compost from my last load left over here. I'm gonna take that down too. And I think I'm gonna take a really quick break first. So I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> Try to make sure nobody is home before I cut it. That was a big one. <laughs> Y'all wanna know how prolific comfrey can be? This is the kind that will not grow from seed. It only grows from root divisions and cuttings. I keep a bucket up by the apple tree, some comfrey leaves in it, and then when it rains, it gets water in it and it soaks the comfrey and then I dump it out and it fertilizes the garden. These are just sitting in water. There's not even root. This is stem. So let's just go stick those in the ground. Why not, right? Put them over there. Yeah. Mulch and then we're finished. Mulch. That's all. There's another tomato bed that I need to do, but it's not gonna happen today. Y'all see this bee, right? Honey, go away, baby. Oh, honey. So there's another tomato bed that needs to be done, and it's not gonna happen right now. <laughs> I do apologize. I would love to get that done and take you with me, but I need to stop. I need to go inside. Things are getting sparkly. <laughs> this is the video that YouTube wants you to watch next, so watch that, and I will see you soon. All right, later y'all.